Okay. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I want to talk about um, emerging pathogen detection and the application of metagenomics um, for the purpose of detecting novel and um, emerging pathogens. Is that there? Yeah. So um, this uh, is kind of a newer technology. It's one that allows us to uh, essentially identify these uh, emerging pathogens without having access to a pre-existing diagnostic. Okay, and so the objectives are here of the, of the module is to, well, to understand a little bit about how metagenomics data is generated. Very, very brief overview of how the metadata is generated and then how we can assign the metagenomics data to specific taxa and then how we can apply that technology for pathogen discovery to identify um, these novel and emerging variants. So um, when we are performing um, infectious disease surveillance, there's essentially two arms. There's like the, the lab arm and then the, the epi arm. And so the epi surveillance is also referred to as syndromic surveillance. This is where you are monitoring for you know, patients who are exhibiting certain symptoms, characteristic symptoms of, of illness, but there are other sources. Um, for example, just general hospital activity would be an example. Reports in newspapers of people getting sick would be an example. People starting to, doctors starting to prescribe certain, um, like, well, a large, more than normal amount of, of antibiotics or antivirals. Lots of non-laboratory sources of information that can give us indication that there may be some type of, of new disease outbreak somewhere in the world. And we have surveillance systems, global surveillance systems, that track this information all the time. And essentially they look for these anomalies, little blips, where it says this is not really what we normally see so at this, this, in this country or at this time of the year. Um, and that can give us a clue and then, of course, there's the laboratory surveillance, and this is one where I think you know we're a lot more familiar. And essentially, what we're going to be doing is using molecular diagnostic techniques to try and identify a new pathogen. This is for standard disease surveillance. So, for traditional laboratory surveillance, the um, there's a, a number of approaches. So microscopy is one is one one approach. Just looking at the cultured isolate under a plate as it grows. Um, there there are biochemical um, tests that you can use to say does it um, you know, well does it does it have a certain set of biological traits or a certain set of phenotypes. There are other phenotypic testing for things like antimicrobial resistance. As we get into more of the molecular techniques, they involve things like serotyping and nucleic acid amplification. There's um, a couple um, of different specific techniques and I will very briefly review them. So the advantage of these molecular methods are um, over traditional methods are for their specificity. Uh, essentially, you know, they are working by recognizing some component of that organism. And the tests that are used to detect that specific component usually are very, very good at detecting that specific component. So antibodies, for example, can tell different subtypes of, say, influenza, um, but they may not be able to detect all influenza. So if you have, say, an H1N1 influenza, you may have an antibody that's good for that, but if you have an H um, 5N1 antibody, your H1N1 antibody will not detect it. So this is this issue of, of specificity versus sensitivity. When you think about specificity as kind of like a lock and key mechanism. So, you know, if you have a lock and there's only one key that can fit it, but it fits it perfectly, then that means it's highly specific. If you have a skeleton key that can open a whole bunch of locks, then that means that that key is very sensitive, that it can, it can, it can, it can open a wide array of locks, but it can't actually, um, it's not specific to just 
one lock. Okay, that's kind of the the analogy. Uh, are there any questions about specificity versus sensitivity? These other techniques that are looking for things like general um, anomalies in the syndromic data, they're very sensitive, but they're given to, to, um, to false positives where it may be that there isn't an outbreak occurring, there's just some other thing that is giving rise to that unusual anomalous blip in the syndromic data for specificity, like I mentioned. Um, they're good for di diagnosing and these molecular techniques are typically good at diagnosing a very specific pathogen, but they can miss a new pathogen, pathogen because the diagnostic is just, just not generalizable enough to detect a range of pathogens. Okay, so serotyping is a long, um, like a, a time used historically popular method for uh, for identifying bacteria and viruses, and, and essentially what it's using are antibody techniques that are um, designed to detect um, specifically various cell surface components known as antigens for those um, for those pathogens. A second molecular method are these or class of molecular methods are the restriction digestion based techniques. And so these use restriction enzymes that recognize a very specific, um, well called a, uh, a recognition <coughs> sequence in nucleic acid data and it will chop it up at that sequence. So that sequence may occur maybe only 15 or 20 times across an entire genome. So if you apply that um, restriction enzyme to it, you'll chop a, a genome up into 20 smaller pieces. Then you can sort those uh, those fragments by their size on a gel and that gives you a specific pattern. As the organism evolves it will start to change some of the band sizes, some will stay the same, some will change, but you can actually use alignment techniques or similarity techniques to say this looks a lot like something that I've uh, performed a restriction digest on in the past. So PFGE, pulse field gel electrophoresis, is kind of the standard workhorse for a lot of surveillance of, of bacterial um, diseases, especially for the foodborne diseases, a lot that is a lot of that is getting replaced by whole genome sequencing. Um, AFLP and robot robotyping are, are, are other similar approaches that are kind of they are uh, well essentially they're kind of they they're a little bit well they extend the use of PFG. So ribotyping, what it'll do is it you um, actually fish out using these ribozymes certain certain subset of fragments from the total set of 20. So you'll get like three or four. So it less it reduces the complexity. AFLP is um, is an F amplification approach. So again, what you're doing is you're just taking some of those amplifying some subset of the fragments and just looking at that subset. So it reduces and simplifies, but it is less specific than than PFGE. Even though PFGE is kind of can, can be considered a whole genome sequencing technique, it only really interrogates just those small sections, right? Um, so the, it's not it's not really considered to be whole genome sequencing in the way that we sort of think about it today. The amplification-based techniques are, are typically ones where you have a set of primers that are have been designed to amplify a specific region in um, from a specific genome, and then you can use something like uh, quantitative PCR to uh, which where you identify well you basically add a fluorescent tag to that primer, and then as you basically perform the PCR operation, you'll start to see a rise in the fluorescent signal over a number of cycles. It's a very sensitive technique, and it can detect very low amounts of pathogen. Okay, but those are so those are kind of the existing set of diagnostic molecular diagnostics that we used routinely um, for the surveillance of. of of existing infectious diseases. Merging infectious diseases are a little bit more of a problem. So they are well defined essentially that um, as diseases incidence has increased just kind of recently over the last 20 years, for example, like SARS or the pandemic H1N1, MERS-CoV, um, other variants of influenza, and then most recently Zika virus, they occur regularly and will continue to occur regularly. But the problem um, for them with these is that your our existing um, toolkit of molecular diagnostics may be too specific to be able to detect that one specific pathogen because it is 
Well, either it has never been seen before, it's recently emerged from, say, a zoonotic transmission from animals into, into humans, or it has evolved substantial diversity uh, to the point where the uh, existing, it pathog or existing diagnostic is no longer able to detect that pathogen. Oops. Okay. All right. So if we want to diagnose emerging diseases, there's a, a couple of techniques that are available to us. One is to enhance the sensitivity of existing diagnostics. And so, for example, this is actually something that I'm involved in um, as part of my research. There's the, you can generate something called heteroseptific antibodies. Um, and um, or these are antibodies that, may, instead of being directed specifically at a certain antigen, like at an H1N1 antigen, you would direct it at a very, like a, an exposed but conserved region of a surface molecule. For example, for, for influenza, it has a, the H stands for hemagglutinin, the N stands for neuraminidase. Both of those molecules are exposed on the surface and both have these highly variable antigenic regions, but they also have some conserved partially exposed regions. And if you're clever, then you can design techniques to generate antibodies that will just recognize that conserved region. And we've um, demonstrated that you can detect all uh, 15 different subtypes of, or I think there's 16 now, of the hemagglutinins and then the nine different neuraminidases um, with these, with monoclonal antibodies that are generated this way. So these are very good for detecting, uh, they won't tell you if you have an H1N1 um, or, an, or, an, or an, you know, an H5N7 or anything like that, right? But they will tell you that you have an influenza virus. And so these are good to have around in case there is a, um, uh, like a, a new um, emergent reassortant influenza virus that um, has a novel epitope that can't be recognized by any of the um, previous diagnostic techniques. This one will, this antibody technique will tell you, yes, at least, you know, you do have an, an influenza. Okay. Um, uh, well, and then there are, you can use degenerate bases in, in your amplification techniques so that they have in an inherent, they will, they have the, well, these certain bases um, can, like in a scene, can um, bond to any of the other bases, the A, G, T, or C. So if you start to incorporate in scenes into your primer, that means it can accommodate some of the, um, some variety in the template sequence that it's, or the target sequence that it's trying to identify and will still recognize it. And so you can, you can get it that way. Um, but they're, they're not perfect. The, the, well, the current best technique for identifying a novel emerging pathogen is to use a whole genome sequencing approach because you don't have to have any pre-existing diagnostic or you don't and have to enhance the sensitivity of existing diagnostics. You just sequence its genome, you look at the genome, and then, and then you attempt to try and diagnose the identity of that novel pathogen just using that genomic sequence information. And the approach that we use is um, shotgun metagenomics. So there's two types of metagenomics that are commonly applied. Um, there's single locus um, amplicon based techniques and these are like the 16S ribosomal RNA technique where you just specifically identify and amplify out one locus and then that becomes a signature for the organism. That's great, but not all pathogens will have a 16S ribosomal RNA. For example, all viruses do not have a 16S ribosomal RNA, so it's not a universal technique for identifying a novel pathogen. Shotgun metagenomics, on the other hand, is um, a technique that allows you to sample the genomes of an entire community of organisms inside of some type of uh, biological specimen. So the the concept is similar to like, to, to like shotgun um, sequencing applied to a single cultured isolate, but now you're just applying it to an entire collection of nucleic acid. Um, so you have your, say, a clinical specimen, which might, say, be a biopsy from a recently deceased person, or it could be a cerebral spinal fluid, blood, 
feces, any type of biological specimen that you suspect may contain the pathogen that you have been unable to diagnose, to diagnose using your, your existing toolkit of a priori molecular diagnostic techniques. Okay, so you can extract the total nucleic acid, which includes the RNA component because some of the viruses are RNA viruses, uh, and uh, some of the pathogens may have an RNA genome like RNA viruses, and the DNA. And then you, in the, uh, at the end of that procedure, you're going to have a combination of your, possibly your pathogen, your um, commensals, which are just the organisms that inhabit our body and, and don't cause disease. That's our microbiome. And you're going to have your host DNA as well. So if, it, if you, so if it's from humans, you're going to have human DNA in there. So you have a really big kind of complicated mixture of nucleic acid in the, in the sample that's been extracted from your, directly from your clinical specimen without using any enrichment techniques. And you can use enrichment techniques, but I'm not going to talk about those right now. Those are, they end up biasing the sample and it's not really important for what we're trying to learn here um, in this. Uh, module. So once you have that that jumble of of host and commensal and possibly pathogen um, nucleic acid, then you well if you have the RNA you'll convert it to cDNA so you have total DNA. Then you fragment it and adapt it just like you would with generating a normal library for a cultured isolate. You put it through your sequencer and then you generate reads from there. And normally you'll generate quite a large number of reads relative to when we're doing a regular um, genome. So a regular bacterial genome might be about 5 million base pairs and so if you want to get good coverage then if you're going to say get like well 10 times coverage that means you're going to need about 50 to generate 50 million base pairs inside of your reads. If you want to get really good coverage you're going to go to 100 times but even those are kind of small numbers of reads to generate relative to when you're generating one of these shotgun metagenomic samples because you may have a very small number of samples of pathogen reads and a large number of reads that are just not. So in order to improve our probability of being able to identify those reads you have to generate really large numbers on the order of about 25 million um, typically 25 to 50 million reads need to be generated. Uh, reads at about say 500, you know, two times 250, so 500 base pairs. So we're really, we're getting up to close to um, a billion base pairs worth of, of reads that need to be generated. Okay, so so this provides a an unbiased survey of your nucleic acid content to the degree that you can say that the, that approach is, is unbiased. There's always, bias of course gets introduced out at all stages for just about any um, molecular um, uh, uh, method, uh, especially for preparing nucleic acids, but th without going to things like, using things like a hybrid capture or a um, other type of enrichment technique, this will give you the most unbiased survey of your nucleic acid content. Like I mentioned, it's going to contain the host plus the microbiome um, and the pathogen. So the this becomes can become a problem because of the relative abundance of the host DNA that we may have extracted out along with the sample. So and that really depends a lot on the biological specimen. For example, um, human fecal. Um, Material contains typically under about five percent of the of host DNA. The rest is all just the microbiome DNA, so ninety-five percent. In cerebral spinal fluid, typically over ninety-nine percent of the DNA that's extracted in a in a CSF stamp sample will contain host. So there's a kind of you're generating a lot of stuff that you already know in advance that you're just going to have to throw away in order to be able to interrogate the fraction that's interesting and may contain your um, your pathogen. And then contamination is also a major concern. Oops, this should have been larger. Anyway, so I mentioned a little bit about how wet labs can be used well to enrich your sample. So there's methods for removing the host DNA. Um, there's methods for specifically trying to capture a certain pathogen. 
they are they work well if you have a high biological load of commensals in your so that if there's not much host to remove in the first place then these host reduction techniques work pretty well the problem with them when, when you're trying to use these host reduction host DNA reduction techniques is if there's a large amount of um, of the host then they will remove a large proportion of the host they'll also remove a large proportion of the of the the, the, the uh, microbial content too and that can severely bias the result in fact you may be removing the um, the pathogen DNA as well okay oops these should have been larger anyways so um, so, but but contamin so coast is one type of contamination, but there's also contamination that can come from other sources that can lead you astray. So your lab reagents, lab coats, the lab worker, the lab just around in the environment, these all can um, can contaminate a sample. For example, in our laboratory, we have um, we have been very active in the. Uh, between the years of about 2003 and 2010 and doing a lot of SARS work and when we started developing these protocols for um, identifying emerging pathogens with these shotgun metagenomics techniques we were finding SARS in all of our samples which was really we were kind of surprised to find out about that and we, we end up doing a test of the environment to see where it came from and it turns out it is coming from just about everywhere even though we have clean rooms to prepare our amplicons and our and our, and our, uh, our libraries they're in lab coats they're in people's beards the there's SARS genomes basically just all over the place in the lab and so you have to take into account the fact that you have to kind of expect that you're going to have contamination so there are ways that you can identify that contamination. The if you by doing the environmental sampling, you can generate a background of the uh, DNA that you um, would that you can assign as contamination that is essentially bespoke to your laboratory, right? So that's a one method to, to remove it. A better, a better the, one of the best method is essentially to run a blank because it, the, so the blank would be. The, um, it contains all of the reagents that you've performed in your workup. It just doesn't contain any of the nucleic acid that you've extracted out from the, from the biological specimen. And um, that provides uh, your, your background uh, set of contaminant DNA that you can also, you know, that you can expect to find and, and you can remove. Interestingly, we when we were doing an, an analysis of a patient who was suffering from a uh, undiagnosed disease um, that was causing um, meningitis we were looking at, at CSF samples and we were consistently finding um, equine um, what is it's EIAV so that's like um, equine what is it? infectious anemia virus right right it's the it's the it's the country version of, of HIV Right, so it affects horses, and we're just like we're thinking like, how did this? Is this per, could this person really have gotten, uh, like say, a zoonotic contamination of this EIAV? But now it turns out when we ran our blank, it's showing up in our blank, and so the methods that are being used to prepare our reagents that we are using, for example, our um, proteases and um, um, polymerases, etc., are at some point I think may have assume have come from some type of equine source possibly and the virus has traveled along with it. Okay. Oh, it's so, too small. so once we um, have our reads and we um, and we're and, and we're considering the contamination component of it at the point we don't really know what the reads are, which organisms they may be derived from. So the first step is, is to well essentially to cluster those reads together so into into similar clusters essentially the, this in the same for people who are familiar with doing 16s ribosomal RNA type of metagenomics it's the method of OTU generation where we kind of just sort of say at a certain similarity cutoff for a read say 98 percent or 99 percent we just assume that they're all going to be the same so 
we can cluster those into these groups of highly similar sequences and then we can just take a representative from that group and then we analyze that and then when we get a taxonomic assignment from that representative we just assign it for everything in the cluster. That once we have those taxa identified then we can consult with our, our clinical microbiologists who know a lot more about the the, 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 um, the symptoms that these diseases manifest than, us, than the bioinformaticians do, and then they can help us to identify a possible etiological agent for the, for, the, for the disease that we're investigating. So it is a kind of an, an optional step um, to do the, the reclustering. It is um, recommended. There are a, some programs that are around that can that can be used to assist in providing that clustering step. I provide a, a list of them here. But once we have either individual um, read phylotyping, which is what we're going to do, or we have the, the clusters, then we can go to the taxonomic mapping step. And so this is a process of taking the reads and comparing them to a database of, um, well, a genomic database where the, I, the, the organism that has been harboring those sequences are known and are assigned to the sequences in that database. By making that comparison, then we can infer that the, our sequence, as long as it has a high enough specificity, came from that organism as well. Okay, so in, when, um, when, when Next Generation Sequencing first came out and we were interested in developing systems for doing the um, for, for emerging pathogen detection using shotgun metagenomics, the, the, the most obvious method that was available to us at the time was to use, um, to use BLAST alignment, where you just simply take your read and you have your database of reference genomes with their taxonomic assignments and then you map that read to that database and it will give you back the, well, the, the, uh, the sequences that contain your read sequence, right? So BLAST is, well, it is, it is, is designed in an era um, prior to whole genome sequencing. So even though it is kind of considered to be a fast alignment technique, it is not fast enough if you need to align 25 million or 50 million reads to a large database of microbial genome sequences. So especially, especially under the type of circumstances where you have an emerging pathogen, and, uh, if it's an undiagnosed novel pathogen that maybe a, a, an individual is, you know, suffering from, and you get a, you know, sample from the clinic, they want to get an answer right away. If you're going to use BLAST, you might it might take five or six days for you to get through all the reads. That's not good enough. You want to be able to get a result around, you know, in the same day if you can, even in a shorter period of time if you can. So it is, too, it is quite slow. The big advantage is that it has an adjustable sensitivity and it has the, of all of the available alignment algorithms that are used to do this type of taxonomic mapping, BLAST has the most sensitivity, which means that there can be, um, well, an adjustable and quite a large range of diversity variation between the read that you have um, sequenced and the the genomic sequence that it is, that is it is homologous to and derived from. So that is nice because it may be the case. I mean, if it is a truly emerging pathogen, novel, haven't seen it before, but maybe it might belong to a certain like uh, class of viruses or a certain family, a certain order higher up in the taxonomic ranks, then it will have, it, you, you will, it will not, that existing virus species will not be represented in the database. And so if you use a very specific alignment <laughs> technique, then it's going to say, I didn't see it. 
But if you have a, something that's more sensitive and allows for more diversity between your newly sequenced genome and the reference genomes, then it can say, well, I found something that looks a lot like it, right? So having that sensitivity is nice, and so BLAST isn't something that you necessarily want to throw away, um, but there are faster methods that um, are, that have been developed and they have a, a, a decent amount of sensitivity. Essentially they have been designed for this type of purpose and so they can um, provide enough effective sensitivity for you to be able to map um, your read to say a family or a class if you can't match it exactly. But when we use the um, the, the BLAST algorithm, it's, you know, the, the, if you get a, you may get a hit to one organism and if the disease symptoms that are associated with that organism match the ones that are, that the patient is presenting or is being, or, or is being presented in the, in the population, then you've got a good candidate hit. But you may actually get hits to multiple, um, possible candidate organisms because they're similar to each other. Some may be existing and some may be, well, well, more novel. Depending on your sensitivity, you can still get hits to a lot of different organisms. Um, and they will have a, essentially a, a, like a bit score or, I don't know, effectively an alignment score that tells you how close they are to each other. Um, but you, you might want to be conservative in your um, choice of, of how you assign that read to a certain taxa. If it is, if it is coming from, if it has been derived from a region that is common amongst a whole set of, of organisms, that means that there's just not enough specificity inherent in that read for you to make a an assignment down, say, to the species level or maybe even to the genus level. So, in that case, the best that you can do is to assign it to the most common recent ancestor of all of the organisms that you that were returned um, from the from the blast analysis. And this is also a, a similar concept for other approaches as well. These uh, pipelines and software that have been developed to I, to do this, what we call phylotyping. Um, they are smart enough to know that if you can map to a set of organisms with a high enough specificity, then they all become likely candidates and you can't choose the one over the other. So what you can do is just look up the taxonomic tree and then you find the, um, well, the, 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 the order or the class or the family or whatever that contains those organisms as, you know, in, in its, um, well, as, well, descendants basically from that, from that rank. Okay. So here is kind of an example where you have these, um, these different organisms that have been identified with a, a BLAST analysis and then they return these BLAST scores. So, so does this show up? So the, the top three here have very high BLAST scores. Two are identical. One is almost identical. And then we have these other ones that are lower, um, but it, you kind of have to supply a cutoff. And if you didn't supply the cutoff in an, in, maybe in, a, in an intelligent way, then the algorithm is just going to say, I'm just going to pull the most recent common ancestor of, of everything that you basically chose to be above a certain cutoff. So if you chose a cutoff of 150, then it will say, okay, I'm going to choose these two and oops, excuse me, and look up the taxonomic tree and say, okay, well, it's a Campylobacteriales, right? It's, a, it's identified the order. If it has, um, if you include 140, then it will say, well, these are proteobacteria, so you're up to the phylum level, which is already pretty high. If you include the Clostridia or the Methanococcus, it's basically just going to tell you it's bacterial. Sometimes you'll just, it'll just return the root of the taxonomic tree. You'll just get out something that says root, which is not that specific. Um, so, you know, you're not really going to, it's not really helping you out a lot um, if you, have these, well, if you have equivalent 
um, high numbers of of these blast scores, but you they are coming from organisms that are distributed out throughout the entire taxonomic tree because it's just going to look up to the essentially to the tip of the tree. Interestingly, when we were doing some development um, of this blast based approach, we were finding um, a lot of our uh, of 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 certain organisms, certain reeds were mapping to the root all the time. And when we did a, an investigation of what the individual taxa for, you know, that were giving rise to those, uh, to that root designation were, they were all mycobacteria. And uh, that was confusing for us um, and the, it turned out the reason why was because at the time that we were doing these investigations the taxonomic tree we were just downloading from NCBI that's what we're using basically to do the taxonomic placement but um, uh, they there recently had been the, uh, the development and the, the synthesis and the publication of an artificial genome for Mycobacteria genitalium, and the they didn't really know where to place it into the taxonomic tree because it was completely artificial. So they can created a synthetic line right up at the top. So at, so in, essentially everything that was synthetic would be a descendant inside the synth uh, the, the synthetic. Um, um, node and then you would have the non-synthetic node so if you had but you're mapping to the because that organism exists inside of your reference database anytime it gets a mycobacteria it's going to pull from the synthetic it's going to pull from the live stuff and it's just going to return the common ancestor which is up at that root so there's there's gotchas all over the place one way around that is to use something called a, a weighted most recent common ancestor tree and so when you get these hits and you start to place them taxonomically instead of just blindly looking up the most com recent common ancestor of all of them then what you can do is a, essentially a kind of a cladistic analysis and you can say uh, what, that when I go up to a you know up one node how what percentage have I captured of the of the of the organisms that have been returned from those from that blast analysis, maybe you get ten percent. You go up another node, you might get thirty percent. You go up another node, you get up maybe seventy five percent. At some point, you can say, well, if I'm capturing, if the if the majority of them are falling into this one taxonomic clade, then that I'm going to use that information basically to to, to prevent me from just traveling up to the root of the tree every time. So that's called the weighted MRCA approach. And it turns out that is actually a very, very effective approach of getting um, um, getting rid of these outliers that just coincidentally happen to have enough similarity that they return a blast hit that's high enough that they that they end up confounding your, um, your MRCA assignments and your taxonomic assignments. Okay, once you have all of the reads mapped to some Tax, one or more taxa, then uh, you can represent that in as a taxonomic abundance, and that what that's what I have here, where um, each this is a taxonomic tree, and all of the reads that have been assigned to some node in the tree, either a, a, some common ancestor or some specific um, organism, the they're represented, the amount of reads that have been assigned to any specific tax are represented by the size of the node. So you can see here, this one a lot have, have got a very general assignment. Some have had a little bit more, you know, some, some more specific assignments, but in but smaller abundances. So if you look at it like this, then that can give you a better sense of which candidate taxa to look at first. Um, because those would be the ones, the idea is the more hits that you have to something that's, to, the most hits that you have to the most specific taxa that you get are likely the, 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 um, the true organism. Questions about that? Programs like Megan, which was an, you know, a, a very early and probably I think still popular program for doing this type of, of shotgun metagenomics approach. They use BLAST. You have to perform the BLAST on the side. It takes your BLAST analysis results. It does all of that taxonomic mapping, mapping to the most recent common ancestor, and then it will display it for you inside of a, 
a, a tree that as represented here where the nodes the size of the nodes are representative of the numbers of the of the reads that map to that to that node okay so so that has that, that was a useful um, early method for doing uh, for identifying possible novel or emerging pathogens from shotgun metagenomics data. But like I mentioned, it's very slow. Unless you have an, a lot of uh, computational muscle, it can take quite a long time. Like I said, it would take us, when we, back in the days when we had about 500 CPU cords, it would take us about five days to, or maybe, no, I think it would take about one or two days to get through 25 million reads, or about three or four days to get through 50 if that's the size that we generated and that all depends on other people's use of the cluster so it's just it's not that great but there has been a lot of work on developing faster algorithms and these are the there's well there's one that I'm going to show you and then in the lab we're going to look at a, a second one um, that is orders of magnitude faster and still give you very very good results so <laughs> Kraken, for example, can identify approximately 1 million reads per minute on a single CPU, like on your laptop, right? So that's a pretty big difference than from 25 million reads on 500 CPUs that take, you know, two days, right? So it's very, very popular. And we're going to take a look at Kraken. It's developed in from Steven Salzberg's lab. Steven Salzberg is kind of like the I would consider him probably to be the most valuable bioinformatician in the world. So he his lab developed um, the Glimmer gene uh, microbial gene predictor, uh, Kraken, of course, other earlier versions of of these phylotypers like Fimble, uh, and, which were useful at time until Kraken came along, um, the Bowtie suite of uh, or is, it, is that called tuxedo suite of like oh, of, yeah, part of right so, the, so his lab developed the tuxedo suite which includes bow tie and cufflinks and cummerbund and a whole bunch of stuff that's basically just used all over the world today these guys really have the, the gas in the tank and they do good stuff anyways this is their approach to doing the the taxonomic mapping so what they do is they decompose the reads into a set of k-mers. And I believe that you have been already been introduced to the concept of k-mers. Just to refresh your memory, what you're doing is just taking a fixed size, a certain sub-size of a length, n, say maybe 10 or 12, and you start at one end of the read and you cut that subsequence out and then you move at a certain step size, either one nucleotide or maybe four nucleotides, and then you'll cut out another one until you have traversed the entire read and generated a set of these kamers. So these are all kamers that, uh, with a step size of one that have been generated from this read, second read here, third read here. You can do this. Um, there are methods that are extremely fast for generating kamers. And then you map the kamers to a taxonomic tree that has a, a that has a bunch of well think about each node as containing the kamers that have been generated from the uh, a reference database of microbial genome sequences. Okay, so we're going to map kamers instead of mapping reads with BLAST to genomes. Now we're mapping kamers to other um, well, we're going to be traverse a taxonomic tree and look to see if we get matches in our these smaller subsets. So here's kind of the idea. So you have a, a kamer and it is coming from, you know, well, some, so it's coming from some read and you, you look and see, is it, con is it, con as I traverse through my tree from the root to the tip, do I find that Kamer um, in one of these nodes as you search through that taxonomic tree. If you do, so the reference database contains that same Kamer, exact Kamer that you have looked at. So we're really good at doing exact matches really quickly. So you can say, "Yep, it's there." So you add a score to that node and say, "I found a I found a read in my experimental data that mat matches to a read that also existed from in the reference data." 
And um, if you, the idea is to try and map it as specifically it can, as it can so that you get down to the very tips of the tree, which is where you have the most specificity. Essentially, this is where we are giving the species level or possibly even subspecies level assignments. Reads here are basically the most, at the tips are the most specific that can be, that could be generated from the, um, from the original Kamer database. But if you can't assign it that specifically, then you can assign it to one of the most recent common ancestors. Kind of like this. Um, so, so you have the read, you take the Kamer, and then you map it in here and you say, okay, well, does it exist in here? The way, if, if it is um, specific enough, so it is really specific, it only exists in them one organism, then what's going to happen, the way, what's going to happen is it's going to say, actually, here it says, I know that it is in this part of the subtree, and it just sort of says, go down this way. So it gives it a very a direction to go, and then it'll, and then this one will say, okay, go down this way, and then go down this way, and then go down this way, and eventually you'll get down to the final placement. So it doesn't actually have to search the entire tree to find out where to place it. It just starts at the start of the tree, and it, the tree kind of gives it directions and say, you go this way, go that way, until it, there's no more directions to go, and then it's basically got the final placement in that tree. Very very fast because you can you can place a camer in one, two, three, four, five steps rather than searching through a tree that may have tens of thousands of different nodes. Okay, and okay, and then um, so here we are assigning camers to these nodes, and here we've got one assigned, here we've got one assigned, here we've got three assigned. But what we're trying, we're not trying to uh, to assign camers. That's not the 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 reason. Uh, that's not the purpose of this experiment. It's to assign the read to a certain taxon, not to assign the camers to a certain taxon. So the read contains the camers. The camers get placed into the tree. So none got placed here and none got placed here. They all kind of got placed over here. And then what you do is looking at the part that where you, where you got placement, you try and find the one that has what's called the the, you, you assign the read to the highest weighted root to leaf path. So this one basically had the most numbers of reads assigned to it. So the, so one, two, three, four, five down here. Reads were assigned here. And so this is rather than go down here where you only had, we had one, two, three reads. Here you can get one, two, three, four, five. So you'd say this is my highest weighted path. I'm going to choose the taxonomic assignment that's associated with that node there. Extremely fast. Very clever. So that's a little bit about the behind the scenes about how Kraken works. Beyond that, um, the process that you use to there's an so there's additional work to be done that is not carried out automatically by the software, and it's basically where your the the context in which you want to do the analysis is important, um, and that can inform you on your experimental design there are typically two types of experimental design. One is called a serial analysis and the other one is called a parallel analysis. So in this example of a serial analysis, the idea here is it is a iterative reductive diagnostic technique. So, and that will make sense when I explain it here. So you start with your, all of your samples. So you've got your commensals, you've got your, possibly your pathogen, you've got your host, the host, you don't want to have to waste time searching all of your databases for the host. So, in the, so because you expect that you're going to have host in there, you know it's going to be in there, prior information. Then a very fast host filtering step right at the start and possibly other contaminants that you may expect to see um, would be your first step. So you use a very fast filtering technique. Just get rid of everything that is basically assigned to the host. Then you can go to a second database that is, say, bacterial data, and you map to the bacterial data. And so everything, all of your bacteria, are, um, the reads that came from bacteria are getting mapped at that stage. And then they do not progress to any further analysis. So everything that is not host and not bacteria gets passed through, and, is, and then it's assigned, say, to virus. That's passed through and assigned, say, to, to protists, and then 
maybe to fungi. That way you are not, you know, when you want to conserve the amount of, of computational resources that you're expending to this type of analysis, then it kind of makes sense that you might want to set them up in a serial analysis so that you're iteratively removing and not reanalyzing stuff because once it's been analyzed, sufficiently for one type of kingdom, then there's not really any need to go further. Okay, well the other one is a parallel analysis pipeline, and this is one where you don't want to take the chance that you may have had a read that is diagnostic for a pathogen that is of a certain class, say a virus, but it just happened to map to a bacteria. Bacteria, for example, contain phage and phager viruses, they're not so important for diagnosing emerging pathogens in humans, right? But that's a concept that's important to think about that there may be the there may be matching sequence data in one in a kingdom that you're not interested in that um, but it pulls and assigns that to it'll assign it basically to some to a salmonella that contains the phage, right? That you have when say if you're looking for phage you're not going to be able to find it unless you search through the salmonella data and find out where it mapped and you can say oh map to a phage region. So these are problems. Can anybody give me an example, a more relevant example where you may filter, inadvertently filter out an important pathogen at one of these prior stages, say a viral pathogen that would be contained, that's not a phage but is contained in one of, in a, in a, in a uh, one of these other databases for another kingdom? Because if it's integrated into the host genome, or...? Can you give me an example of a virus that might be integrated into the host genome? Well, EBV is episomal. I don't know if that would be... Or I guess some retroviruses. Like retroviruses. So if there's a novel retrovirus, right, that... Or if there's a, if there's a novel pathogen that has sufficient similarity to an existing retrovirus, that is, that is inside of the human DNA gets removed right at the host stage, right? So you have to, got to be thinking all the time. There's biology is just like that. It likes to play, prank you every step of the way. So in those cases, it might be better to use a, uh, instead of using an iterative reductive technique to basically say, well, I'm actually going to, rather you not even get, you remove the host filtering step and just run everything through every um, possible um, classification uh, or, or uh, kingdom of, of pathogen that you can and, um, and see what's in there. And then um, typically at the end you're going to get a bunch of assignments and then you may, if you have say a truly novel virus that has no representation in the database at all, then it just not doesn't map to any databases. And so because these are kind of these iterative filtering techniques, they say, okay, if it doesn't map to this database, go and take the unclassified reads and map them to this database, etc. At the end, you're gonna end up with a set of unclassified reads that belong to that pathogen. It's just that it doesn't, it can't be assigned taxonomically. Is there, can anybody think of anything that you might be able to do with that? with those unclassified reads that might give you an indication that it's real and not just say some type of artifactual read that is some just garbage junk that has, has not, not even real but has managed to be spewed out from your sequencer, which does happen. Exactly. Very good. You guys are a good class. You can assemble them, right? Because if they do come from a real organism and there's some overlap that you, because when you did your random sampling and it's shotgun, there might be some overlap. If you can even get two reads to overlap, then that gives you a sense that those reads came, were derived from a real pathogen, not just some random junk that's been generated. Yeah. Okay. And well, you can do a Hail Mary and you can just take, say, an assembled set of reads and map them or send them out to the, to NCBI for a blast analysis at that point where you have more sensitivity um, in the result than you may have using things like Kraken and um, it would it might be able to place that read to a certain family or order of, of a certain type of pathogen and give you some more clues give you a partial taxonomic assignment and for, from there that might give you enough 
to go forward with. At that point, these are, I mean, these are all hypothesis generating procedures at this stage. It kind of says these are candidates for what this emerging pathogen might be. If you identify something that says is unclassified but assembles and say maps to, um, to, to a like a, a phylovirus or something like that, then you can say, okay, well, this matches the symptoms as well. Let's go back to the patient, and then we can design some specific diagnostic primers. Now that we have, we've kind of bootstrapped our way into getting some information from that novel pathogen that we can use to make a specific diagnostic and go back into that patient and test it and see if it comes shows up positive. And that way we have a better confirmation that that is um, the, the actual etiological agent of that, that, that disease. Which point do you pick the, for the blank something? For the blank? Oh, well, the, the, so the blank would, so there's a, a contamination step here that I do not include, okay? And I, I should have included. Normally, the way that we have it is host plus contamination. We consider the host to be contamination. So you could, you would have a, contam so I should modify this so that there is a contamination step as well. Yeah, and so your blank would be there. Um, yeah, either at be prior to host or subsequent to host, but before you actually start mapping to any of any of the database, that's when you would map it to your contamin your contaminant database, which would contain whatever showed up in the blank, right? Or what are the collection of sequences that you have assembled from an environmental analysis of your laboratory? I was wondering. So, of course, like Blast is the most sensitive and the gold standard, uh, but it's very slow. Uh, you said that uh, it well, takes a lot of time, especially if you have 25 million of reads. But if you, what if you like also kind of reassemble them and you know, collapse this number of reads and reduce it to like one million? If there's a good right. That's that clustering step that I talked about before. OTU. Yeah, OT, so you can do the OTU generation part, and then you're just selecting one representative. So you might be able to collapse 25 million reads down. Well, if you get 25 million reads and 99% are a host, Right. The first thing you do is just get rid of the host, right? But um, if you have a fast host um, reduction algorithm, and we're going to look at that today. But yes, in general, maybe it's from fecal, so it's less five percent is host. So you're not really getting much of a, a computational efficiency by removing the host. At that point, you still have, you know, if it's you still have twenty million reads, so you would likely want to do uh, clustering. And then also you can, this is something that I don't really discuss here and I don't want to get over complicated, but it's probably worth um, ending off on. There, there are methods for assembling um, your metagenomic read data. So it's not going to assemble them back into full genomes, but if it does find some overlapping reads that are sufficiently untangled from the rest of the system that I can say, well, I can extend these into a little mini contake, right? And they have variable success rates. But as the read gets longer, there's more information that can discriminate one organism from another organism. So that makes sense, right? I mean, at the whole genome level, you can discriminate between organisms that differ by one base pair, right? And at the just say the one gene level, you, you might not be able to discriminate between organisms within a certain genus or a certain family, right? So the longer the connected read is, the effective read or the contig is, the more specificity you have at the taxonomic mapping stage to be able to discriminate between two possible um, candidates taxa. So, uh, but it's, that, inc that involves a, a, a lot of additional computational expense. Um, there is a lot of interest these days in using the MinION platform to do emerging pathogen detection because it can generate these extremely long reads. It, um, it, I mean, it generates a lot of data, but it doesn't generate a lot of reads in, a, in, in one run. So you don't, you're not going to get 25 million reads, and I don't recall just how many reads you'll get out of a typical MinION run. It's not that many. I remember. But that's because they're so long, yeah. right? So, does anybody have an idea about how many? We usually get like fifty thousand. That's about fifty thousand on that on that range, right? Okay. So, and it's expensive, 
So you might just be analyzing, you know, if, if you get nothing but host DNA back, you just spent a thousand dollars and you've got nothing. But one read that's long enough is sufficient to be able to uniquely identify one an organism. So if you did manage to actually get the pathogen sequenced in one of the pores of a from a, from the Minion technology, you're pretty much done. Also, they have. Uh, well, it's portable. You know, you can just basically essentially just plug it into your laptop. And they do have kits now that um, are we're testing to uh, that can uh, generate your library in approximately 15 minutes. And it's really just sort of a plug and play thing. Just put your sample in there, put your add the kit, wait 15 minutes, stick it inside your minion and it starts, starts spinning out the data. So these are very attractive technologies for emergency response types of situations. So if there's a, like a bioterrorism event and you need to know if it was, it may be, it could be that it was an environmental pathogen. For example, Bacillus anthracis, it could be, um, you know, it could be a person could become infected because of malfeasance, right? Or they could be infected just because they are hanging out, you know, in a field of sheep, right? So there's, there's, it's important to know early in biocrime events, how, you know, the, the attribution and the likelihood of if it's, if it's real or if it's not. Um, and for if there, if you want to um, respond to an emerging outbreak of a pathogen like Ebola, you want to be able to detect people who have Ebola early and quickly, like inside of 15 minutes or 20 minutes, then these Minion technologies are very good for that. It's just the problem is they don't, they only generate about 50,000 reads. They generate the, the information very quickly though. Um, and, uh, but you also need, need a large amount of DNA in the sample to be able to generate the reads. So it's not really that good for if you just have like very small amounts of sample, which is often the case, unfortunately. Um, so. Those are, I don't have anything to show you on that because the methodologies are still, that is a very rapidly evolving technology right now, especially on the bioinformatics side. So I hope maybe in a, in a year or two to be able to introduce the, the Minion um, long read technologies, real time long read technologies for emerging pathogen detection. That's the end of my talk. Are there any questions? I think I managed to get through it in an hour. It's not bad. Okay. Okay. Uh, regarding the elimination of pathogen identification, so the PFDE or the ALE now emissions, is there a problem? So uh, recently I noticed there are some paper regarding the crawfish. Uh, yeah, phage typing? Dead. Pretty much a dead technology. Yeah. So I mean, phage, phage have a very specific tropism. Right, so they will infect certain. Uh, some of them will infect only very, very specifically one subtype, right, um, and not another subtype. And so their presence um, is an indication, basically, of the subtype of the organism that harbors it. But now that we have whole genome sequencing, it's just not. It never really became a very popular. Um, molecular method, diagnostic method. Um, there's, I'm not aware of any standard method that we use for any type of diagnostic or reference service or surveillance service at the National Microbiology Lab that uses phage typing. So it was kind of like an interesting thing that was kind of going on at the side, but is just not really, certainly no longer a, a viable technique. This is in my opinion, I could be wrong. I usually am. So that's just that's just my opinion. Yeah, but usually I noticed some people mentioned, uh, for example, for salmonella, there's some pages they just inserted and then according to the characteristic of the salmonella, they just inserted and they just inserted and they just inserted and then according to the characteristic they just inserted and they just inserted and they just inserted and they just Well, that's true too. So the, 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 the variation of the phage that's a, that is in the salmonella is, based, is also a method for you to type the salmonella. But so uh, I think it was mentioned earlier that the you know Public Health England they sequence all of their salmonellas every isolate that they get they do a full genome sequence so the phage information is in there but there's also a lot of additional information that's available to do the typing we have a the that salmonella in silico 
typing system that I think we demonstrated for you yesterday and have results in. That is the primary method for serotyping, in silico serotyping, basically um, globally right now. That's really the main method for salmonella serotyping. It's not phage typing. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, thanks.